Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Chris Hilton. I am a continuous delivery architect at Gap, and I am obsessed with continuous delivery, uh, possibly to the point of madness. I'm gonna let you be the judge of that after this presentation. Um, I've been a build and release manager uh, since 2000 uh, at various enterprise software companies and consulting gigs. Uh, and I have spent lots and lots of time thinking about how to deliver quality software, uh, fat, uh, quality software uh, as fast as possible and reliably as possible. So um, all of that experience has led me to explore uh, what I think are some pretty nifty, but other, others might say extreme ideas that uh, build off of the current state of the art in continuous delivery. And I want to share some of that uh, pathology or uh, ideas with you today. Um, I'm going to be starting with the ideas that I've actually implemented and worked on over the last few years, and uh, then I will uh, segue into some of the, my more uh, aspirational or crazier ideas for the future. So to start off, uh, I'm guessing you all have some knowledge of continuous delivery, uh, the continuous delivery concept and its ideas as it exists today, since you've all chosen to attend a presentation entitled Beyond Continuous Delivery. Um, as a longtime build engineer myself, uh, I'm more focused on the build and release aspects uh, of continuous delivery than, say, the, the development or business process, act, business process aspects. Uh, so my job generally focuses on building uh, pipelines similar to that shown for different pieces of software. Uh, in my case, mostly rather large and or complicated enterprise software projects. Um, just to like, have a quick overview of like a typical pipeline for a continuous delivery, yes? Is it not going closer? I'll get a little closer. How's that? Um, so for this particular pipeline, we have you know, the first stage where the developer is doing some coding. They check in. That uh, kicks off a continuous integration process where it uh, builds and tests their code, creates an artifact. Assuming all of that passes, it automatically gets promoted to a functional testing stage where the you know, functional testing is done. If all of those tests pass, it's automatically promoted to the next stage of perf testing and so on to user acceptance testing, then finally to a staging environment, and then into, pr into production. Um, so I spend a lot of time, like I say, building pipelines like this. Uh, when, uh, and when implementing a continuous delivery system, uh, some of the important uh, points of continuous delivery I try to address with the pipeline are ensuring that we can have frequent automated releases. Um, we want every check-in to be a potential release, uh, and also every check-in immediately triggers feedback on that production readiness or suitability of, the, uh, of that change. And we want to get that feedback back to the person or the committer who made that change as fast as possible so that they um, can qu quickly bring the uh, system back into production readiness uh, and without losing context of the work they were doing. Uh, in order to do all that, we basically need to automate pretty much everything. Uh, both to ensure you know quick um, uh, you know a quick movement through this uh, pipeline, but also you know that we get repeated reliable results, and so that uh, you know we're we're always getting uh, uh, good feedback back to the user on what is uh, on on his commit. And then we say we, we want to build quality in, so we have the um, testing at every stage should completely ensure that the uh, artifact is actually ready to be promoted to the next, to, you know, through the rest of the pipeline. Oh, so anyway, uh, you know, and just to reduce it down to like the, the really basic idea is making sure that the software is always production ready and quickly getting feedback about changes to the system, whether it's positive or negative. Uh, this process, process is pretty simple for small, independently releasable applications. Um, but it can get much more complicated when dealing with large, complex, and related systems, as we'll soon see. So some of the, as background, some of the assumptions I'm also you know, assuming that uh, uh, for this discussion today, um, I, I assuming everyone's here fairly familiar with, and like I say, there'll be a foundation for the later discussion. Um, Trunk-based development is a pretty generally accepted practice for continuous delivery and uh, simplifies our discussion of pipelines. Uh, you can do all of these ideas I'm gonna talk about with some form of branch-based development, it just, but it just adds another layer of complexity that I'm going to avoid for this discussion, and I don't particularly recommend it anyway. Trunk-based development for the win. Uh, I also assume you know the basics of continuous integration, delivery, and deployment, and for this discussion, that's pretty much going to mean every change starts a feedback process that encompasses the entire pipeline in an automated uh, fashion. And, and then also for the purposes of the dis this discussion, uh, I'll be assuming that the pipeline uses cloud resources that are cheap or, and unlimited, and basically unlimited. Obviously, this isn't entirely true in the real world, and I'm going to be pushing this particular assumption to some uh, rather ridiculous lim limits you'll, again, you'll also soon see, uh, but I'm going to go with it for the sake of this discussion. 
So the uh, first idea shouldn't be particularly con controversial. It's simply using uh, modular development to break up larger builds into smaller build units, and then using dependency management to define a pipeline based on the dependency relationships between those modules. Uh, here, there's an example of you know, it's a very basic you know, Java web application where the build has been broken up into four different modules. The four different modules have dependencies between them, uh, so if a change is made to one module, a new version of that module is built, and then the modules that depend on it are rebuilt and tested with that new version of the module. So in this example, if a check-in is made to the AJAR module, it gets rebuilt, and then the AppWar module is rebuilt and tested with the new version of AJAR. In an uh, extreme case of, say, the common jar were to change, then it would get rebuilt, and then all of the modules would get rebuilt and tested to make sure the application is still working and production ready you know, from bottom to top. Now, this example is pretty simple. You might be thinking, you know, why bother? A more realistic example I, I, I tend to deal with is something like this. So this is one of the moderately complex applications that I, I've worked with uh, at, uh, let's say, certain uh, enterprise uh, software uh, companies. Uh, there are even more complicated ones. Uh, to keep it simple, though, I'm going to stick to talking about our uh, simple example instead. So what can you do with dependency management and uh, modular applications that you can't do with a monolithic build? Well, one thing that makes it easier to share modules. Um, we could, uh, if uh, we have another application, let's say, that needs to use uh, the B jar, we can just uh, basically uh, you know, set up a new module for, the, for that new application that knows how to retrieve the, uh, the B jar artifacts from the artifact repository you know, just using our dependency management system. Um, it also makes it easy to chain builds in, in a situation like that where, as kind of mentioned earlier, where each module is kicking off its downstream modules. Uh, in this case, like the B jar module wouldn't even necessarily have to know about all of the modules that are using it. It just automatically kicks them off. So we, we automatically get kind of this chained pipeline build operation. Uh, we can also get some uh, more optimized builds where we, we either get minimal builds or what we call kind of impact zone builds where we build only what's been updated. As I mentioned earlier, like if the B jar changes, we don't need to rebuild all of this. We just need to rebuild the B jar and then rebuild the app war to make sure that it still works with that new version of the, of the, uh, of the B jar. We don't have to do a whole new monolithic build of, of everything. And we can also uh, introduce some optimization around parallel building. So in a, typically in a monolithic sequential build, you would probably see common jars built, then AJAR, then BJAR, then AppWar. Whereas now that we've broken it up into modules, uh, even if common jar changes, we can actually kick off two side-by-side -side builds of AJAR and BJAR, you know, get, that love, get some optimization there by building those in parallel with that new version of common jar. And then finally, uh, building AppWar with the, with the change. So, all of this is great for uh, optimizing software builds, but software doesn't run by itself. It runs on hardware. So what about when the hardware changes? So now, with infrastructure as code, we can add infrastructure modules and include those in our dependency tree, ideally with tests just like the software modules. Uh, these infrastructure modules can also build and test uh, independently when changes are made to them. So here we have a base VM module that defines the basic virtual machine our application will be running on. And on top of that, we have a dependent module that adds some basic IT setup, let's say, you know, monitoring, security, uh, the, you know, the basic, uh, you know, stuff your, your, your corporate IT, uh, you know, needs. And then say another module that adds some environment-specific uh, configuration scripts. Uh, I'm keeping the specific infrastructure as code tool vague here so as uh, not avoid any holy wars. I don't want to start any riots between the chef, puppet, ansible, salt, whatever, people. Um, but anyway, if, uh, if a change is made to any, any one of these modules, then the change is tested and then rippled up through the pipeline to make sure the system is still production ready for you know, both hardware and software. You know, anything that could affect the operation of this application in production is now you know, like, you know, fully being tested. So in this case, uh, you know, we, we, all of this bubbles up to the isolation test module where it deploys the latest code onto the specified infrastructure and runs tests on that isolated application like functional tests, exception, acceptance tests, et cetera. So before I get too far uh, into the, the making these dependencies too complicated, uh, I want to talk a bit about this uh, semi-fluid dependencies concept and how it can keep every module up to date with respect to its dependencies, but also make sure that everything is always in a working state. So the, the basic idea of semi-fluid dependencies are that they're a combination of static and fluid dependencies. 
Now, with static dependencies, uh, th those are where you depend on a specific version of a module. Um, in this diagram, it's signified by the explicit numbering scheme to the left of the colon, such as app or depending on version 2.1 of AJAR. So this method is very stable because you're always dealing with the same version of your dependency. When you run your build, you're always gonna get that same version, you're gonna get reliable build off of it. If anything's broken, it's because something you've done locally in your code, not because of dependency, right? But it's also hard to keep up to date manually, especially if dependencies are always changing. Uh, your dependencies are always changing, you need to keep up to date with them. In contrast are fluid dependencies. Now, this is where you depend on a version range of a module, uh, such as always depending on the latest version, uh, which is what I generally do for internal dependencies in a pipeline. This is signified on the diagram by the non-specific numbering scheme to the right of the colon, um, such as app or depending on the 2.0 or later version of AJAR. So this method keeps the dependencies up to date easily because you're always pulling in the latest changes as they're, as they're being published. Um, but it can also break things easily when external dependencies ch uh, change and uh, break your, often break your code. So in particular, uh, this idea came up because at one large company I was working at, the, the fluid dependencies were causing development outages for the web team several times a week. Um, it was a very large travel site. There were about 100 libraries that were being depended on from various other projects in the organization that all needed to be kept up to date. Um, but it also meant you know, se you know, several breaking changes during the week, and this would cause several hours of downtime every week as each developer had to figure out what, depend what dependency that I just resolved suddenly broke everything that's, that's going on. Or was it, was it the dependency or was it my code? Uh, I'm not sure. And uh, with a team size of around 150 developers, that was about twenty-five dollars to $50,000 in lost productivity a week just, just for this one team. So with semi-fluid dependencies, I tried to get the best of both worlds. Uh, Every dependency has both a static and at least possibly a fluid dependency. And so what happens is when developers build locally, they use the static dependencies. And, and uh, uh, on the, uh, basically as part of the, the build system, it, it would use the fluid dependencies. Uh, there's kind of a, basically a separate automated system that uses the fluid dependencies to you know, look, for new, look for new dependencies, then automatically run a test against those new dependencies, run, you know, bring in the new dependency, run tests, and only once the tests have actually you know, passed uh, all, all of the testing, up, automatically update the stat static dependency to this new last known good version of the dependency. So uh, basically, so the developers are only getting, having to work with you know, known good versions that have actually been tested in, in the pipeline. So if we're, if we're looking at our, at our diagram, when the new ver we're, let's say we're publishing a new version 4.2 of Common, Common Jar. So the automated system builds a jar with the new version of common jar, and it passes. So the static dependency is updated to 4.2. So now if you're a developer on a jar and you synchronize from the source code repository, you will now build with 4.2 version of common jar, and you are good to continue developing in your, in your world. At the same time, the build for uh, this automated update build for bjar also runs, but it doesn't pass. So the static dependency remains at 4.1 for common jar. Uh, the last known good version that's actually passed, you know, testing with, with the bjar module. So if you're a developer on bjar, you can continue to work with the old version of common jar without a problem. And optionally, maybe, uh, depending on your build system, the app for uh, module may also build to attempt to incorporate the new version of ajar, but it will also fail because of a dependency version conflict with, uh, for common jar. So the old dependency versions remain. So it, again, it's also, um, in a state where developers on AppWar can also continue to work without any problems because they're using the old, last known good versions that have been tested at, at that, at that uh, module. So at this point, all of the developers can still build and work on every module you know, independently because they each have static dependencies on known good versions. Uh, so the damage to the pipeline has been contained and you know, developers can stay productive. Most times, like a 95% plus uh, at this particular job, uh, new dependencies were updated automatically, you know, just brought right in and everyone got the updates and continued along. But the rest of the time, you know, when those changes came in, they weren't broken, uh, or things were broken, developers stayed productive, but you know, we have to let someone know that there's a problem here and it's gotta be resolved, right? You know, so that we can continue to stay up to date. So the architects would be notified and eventually they'd have, they'd have to resolve this problem manually. This could be resolved you know, one of two ways. Either we update bjar so that it works with the new version of common jar, or we publish a new version of common jar that, that works with bjar. So in this particular case, we're gonna say that we published a new 4.3 version of common jar with a fix. So the ajar build passes, it updates its static dependency, 
VJAR also does the same. It, it, up, it uh, builds, passes, and updates its static dependency. And now App4 updates the static version for both of its JAR dependencies. So now basically we're, we're back to, we're getting continuous flow from, uh, from all of our dependencies, but you know, all the way up through App4 and then you know, continuing on up in, into the pipeline. So again, I, I implemented something like this at that previous job I mentioned, and it uh, vastly cut down on the build problems you know, from external dependencies, kept, kept developers productive, and saved them like a couple million dollars of lost productivity a year, you know, just from the you know, sheer scale of all the developers they had and all the you know, problems they were encountering. Now there's, there is still some potential confusion on what's happening in the pipeline, and uh, you know, some back and forth that has to happen between the common jar team and the B jar teams, like who broke what and you know, who, who needs to do something um, you know, in order to rectify this situation. So uh, I'm gonna talk about more about eliminating the introduction of errors later. Um, for now, I'm gonna continue to build on the pipeline example uh, I've been laying out and talk about integrating our application with another ap application. So here, uh, I've added another application, and we have an integration test module now that knows how to take those two individual mo mo uh, applications that have been tested in isolation and now test them together. So here you can see that our other application, it's a bit more complex uh, as far as you know, its modular dependencies go. Um, it can uh, take advantage of more of those uh, modular uh, development optimizations we, we talked about. And when any of those you know, individual modules change, we can do an impact-based build that rebuilds or reruns the, just the dependent modules above it. So I'm just kind of reiterating that point because it's gonna become even more important uh, very soon. Uh, um, for now, just focusing on the integration testing. Um, in a lot of pipelines, uh, you might see applications that go through uh, an integration testing phase where the application is tested with some version of another, of an, another application, but it's not necessarily the same version of that application it eventually ends up running against in production because they have independent uh, promotions uh, to, uh, to production. So this can lead to errors where you know, something worked in the pipeline, I, was, I worked fine against this one particular version of this app, but it the, turns out the, the version of the app I end up running against in production is some, behaves somehow differently and cause, causes problems. So to combat that, I use an idea called uh, fusion testing. So uh, the basic idea is that once a specific version of, of one application is integration tested with a specific version of another application, those particular versions are now tied together, or what we call fused, and will be promoted together through the rest of the pipeline. So here, we're saying like the 3.4 version of the application on the left is tested with the 4.7 version of the application on the right in the integration test module then those two versions of those applications are promoted together to the staging segment where they're further tested together, and finally to the production segment to be deployed together to production. Now, because we're assuming a continuous delivery, continuous, uh, continuous delivery world, both of these applications are always production ready, so it should be no problem to release both of them into production together when either application is ready to be released. So, maybe a bit idealistic, but you know, that's the idea. Um, so now we have a dependency tree that extends all the way to production and can be triggered by any change anywhere in the system. So if any module that influences our production system changes, that module is rebuilt and tested, along with all of its dependent modules until that change finally ends up in production. Ideally, we're re releasing frequently, perhaps with even as few changes as only one change. So even though the dependency graph may look like it's getting you know, big and complicated, only small amounts of change should actually be you know, warming working their way through the, through the graph you know, and, actually, and finding their way into production at any particular time. So I'll, I'll just mention that, that at this point, uh, I, uh, I tend to call these modules, that, you know, once we get to this kind of scale or um, um, pipe segments, as in pipeline segments, um, just because modules tend to be kind of a more software specific term. So I, and I guess I just prefer to kind of say segments as more of like a specifically about the pipeline and the steps on the path to production, whether that's software, whether that's infrastructure, whether it's integration or testing related or what have you. So, so now uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add in the, the cloud infrastructure into the mix now and propose that now we have all of this infrastructure as code defined in the pipeline. We can do something radical like clone parts or even all of the pipeline onto an identical set of virtual hardware but isolated from the main pipeline. So with all of the pipeline infrastructure you know, well-defined in source code, we, sh we should be able to create a copy of, of, of part or all of the release pipeline from the point of view of any particular segment. 
dependencies on segments you know, outside of this clone pipeline will just use the last known good version, uh, you know, like we discussed earlier. So here there's a copy of the pipeline from the common jar segment all the way to the staging segment. So now that we've got this kind of separated, you know, its own world kind of pipeline, what can we do with it? Well, we can do something like a personal developer pipeline. So with this clone pipeline, we could actually run a separate but identical pipeline identical to the you know, release pipeline that tests the developer's changes on identical hardware as, as the, like I say, the main pipeline. So has anyone here ever heard a developer say, you know, it works on my machine? Yeah. Yeah, well, now you can say, no, talk to me when it works on your pipeline with identical hardware and identical setup as the release pipeline. Um, another benefit is that the code will be better tested, almost certainly better than the developer could reasonably do locally or probably do locally, like integration tests are notoriously unreliable or unlikely to be run by developers locally. Um, you know, there's just too much setup involved. Um, unlike before, um, when, when the common jar breaks the build for bjar, this time it happens in a separate developer pipeline instance and the developer knows there's a problem before he even commits the code. So he can, you know, he can, you know, basically by having this, you know, his own developer pipeline, he can see his pro the problems that are going to happen, you know, way down the pipeline before he even, uh, you know, actually causes the problem that, that, and inflicts it on everyone else. So you could even use a clone pipeline as a requirement for committing code using something like a pre-flight pipeline. So with most pre-flight build concepts, you just run the individual module and test before the change is accepted for commit, you know, like say just like the common jar, jar module. Using a clonable pipeline, we can actually reject change, changes that would cause problems much deeper into the pipeline. And, and this should greatly cut down on the number of errors introduced into the pipeline. So this concept um, is something that has been in demand at, at least four of the last five places I've worked at, but uh, I'm just now finally getting close to being able to implement it uh, where I'm at now. The rest of this presentation gets more uh, and more speculative and let's say a little more out there about uh, what I would like to do to make the release process faster and better. So speaking of speculative, I'll talk about speculative pipelines. Uh, uh, one of the pro problems we have with pipelines for complex systems is that it can take quite some time uh, to do many phases of testing before determining a set of artifacts are production ready. So for the portion of the pipeline shown, um, we have, you know, you say we, we generate basically the artifact at the app or module, and then we do several layers, uh, uh, stages of testing afterwards. Uh, um, but the thing is those subsequent stages aren't actually creating any new artifacts. All they're doing is doing kind of more and more testing with, uh, like I say, in different environments and with different uh, you know, system setups. So what we can actually do um, is uh, basically instead of running those three test segments sequentially, we can keep, kick each of them off in parallel on their own set of cloud resources with the caveat that each segment can only pass if its tests pass and all of the previous logical segments pass. So each of the dependent segments basically gets a jump start on its testing without having to wait for the previous segments to finish. And if a previous segment does fail, then those dependent logical segments uh, can be basically aborted and thrown away since the artifacts that they're testing are not actually eligible to be promoted to that uh, segment in, or stage anyway. In the hopefully common case of test passing, you've saved a lot of time by running the, the segments and the testing in parallel. And in the uncommon case where tests fail, well, all you've done is waste some cloud resources. Um, so we're able to get feedback, you know, even sooner with this technique. Uh, and, uh, but I'm still a little obsessed with the, with the preventing errors from getting in the pipeline in the first place. So if we go back to our, our pre-flight pipelines, where, you know, we've mentioned how we're getting, you know, or talked about how we're getting much better at catching errors before they, before they can turn our pipeline red. But there are certain situations that you know, a pre-flight pipeline on its own can't catch. So in this di diagram, uh, we've got uh, DevOps A and DevOps B just representing, you know, different engineers committing code. Code into the system, and they each have their own pre-flight pipelines. So these two pre-flight pipeline, pre pipelines, the each ran successfully on their own, but when their changes are merged into the trunk, some conflict of their operation causes the main pipeline to fail. So we're, you know, we're getting far fewer errors, but you know, we still have this you know, potential for error. And there are even more com complicated situations where that can, can arise. Here we have three different developers all making three different changes, you know, each of them all you know, su 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 bleh, successful on their own, and all the three changes finally end up in, tr in trunk, you know, there's, we, it's really hard to say like what exactly the combinations of the three changes, how, how, how it is that's breaking, that's breaking things, so. Um, 
Multi-commit interactions basically can, can be like particularly vexing problems to sort out. So uh, there's still some opportunity for redness here to creep into our pipeline. We don't like it. As uh, testing is running, you know, testing is basically running while com new commits are being made. So this is a common problem even uh, even now in developers' day-to-day -day work as they do the check-in dance where you're trying to get the latest code from trunk and make sure that your changes work with the with the latest trunk code. But while you're doing that, other people are checking into trunk, and you know you end up in this uh, you know circle of you know sooner or later you just make the dive and you know check in your code and hope it, and hope it passes. So, um, and this problem you know gets even further exasperated by the longer testing cycles of like this pre-flight pipeline concept, right? So we need a way for changes to be entered and tested in an orderly fashion. So this is where I uh, introduce a concept called quantum pipelines. So here there's a trunk pipeline. It's already at change n, whatever number, and we know that it's green. Uh, then change n plus one comes in, and a pre-flight pipeline kicks off with that change. So what happens when the next change comes in? Well, we could wait for this pipeline to complete, and then, and then kick off uh, the next pipeline, depending on whether change one is accepted or rejected. Um, but that's not really gonna scale very far, you know, with many changes coming in and or a long running pipeline. So with our clonable pipelines concept, we can, you know, do something better. Instead of waiting for the first pipeline to complete, we can kick off two uh, more sub pipelines, one with and one without change one. So that way we can start testing change two immediately. Now, I call this a quantum pipeline because we can't be sure which sub-pipeline yet is going to represent the state of the n plus two change until further observation is made of the n plus one pipeline. So let's say, as it happens, that the n plus one pipeline completes successfully. So when the n plus one pipeline completes, we can collapse the wave of the quantum pipeline and abort the unneeded sub-pipeline that assumed the n plus one pipeline would fail. And we just continue testing the, the pipeline that includes the change one and now change two. So this will, this pipeline, when it completes, will represent the true state of this M plus two pre-flight pipeline. Uh, hopefully I'm not the only physics nerd who gets the whole quant quantum collapsing wave things. Um, but anyway, uh, the wave can also be said to collapse if both of the uh, sub-pipelines complete with the same state, either success or failure. So if, if your change two is so bad that both of the pipelines just fail immediately, you'll immediately you know, get feedback that the, that change is bad and, and get rejected and, and we and can move on, you know, regardless of even waiting for the uh, N plus one pipeline at all. Um, and looking at a third change, we can see how the quantum pipelines can potentially get kind of more and more complex and, uh, you know, uh, large and grow in scale, but also most of the pipelines will be aborted early depending on results from the earlier pipelines. So here, um, when N plus one completes successfully, Half of the running sub-pipelines are aborted, all of, the, all of the ones that were assuming that a change one would fail. Then when N plus two pipeline does fail, the associated N plus three sub-pipeline sub is also aborted, the one that assumed a change suit to success. So finally, the N plus three pipeline uh, will complete, and the one that includes the N plus one change, but not the N plus two change. So it, it will complete, it completes successfully, and it can commit to, um, to trunk. So now we have only changes that are successful within the entire pipeline, uh, or at least within the, the length of the cloned pipeline being committed to trunk. At this point, it should be impossible for the trunk, for the trunk pipeline to ever be read because, um, uh, like I say, the, it's, you're only testing one change at a time, and that one change has, has basically already been tested in, uh, you know, in an identical pipeline. Um, I call this an evergreen trunk, evergreen trunk because I like the pun. Uh, what's, like I say, and, and because these uh, successful pipelines are exact copies of the trunk pipeline, you can actually, you know, just use the artifacts from these builds and use them directly without having to rebuild them in a trunk pipeline, you know, and just, you know, recreating effort. Uh, so this is where I get to the really far out stuff, and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll blow, some blow some minds by the uh, end of the presentation here if I haven't already. Um, so what I call uh, extreme integration is an extension of the idea of extreme continuous integration to pipelines. Uh, if you aren't familiar with extreme continuous integration, it's a concept where as you're programming, you're typing on your computer, there's a process in the background that's continuously running your unit tests as you are typing and giving you instant feedback on the state of your code uh, without you even, need, even needing to explicitly run the test. So you're typing away, you, you, write, a, you write a test, so you know, hopefully you're a good uh, TDD developer, you write your test and it's a failing test. So immediately you get the feedback that your, um, your, you know, your tests are red or failing, 
you continue, and then you go and work on the implementation, and then as you're working, you know, eventually you get the code in the right state, and, and or what you think is the right state, you know, the tests run in the background and let you know, nope, it's still red, you, you've got some problem, uh, you look at it a little bit more, okay, now you fix it. Tests automatically run in the background, boom, green, you know you're, you know you're good, right? And, that, and your te all your tests are passing. So basically it's the, the same concept extended to, you know, the, the to the entire you know, notion of this like pre-flight pipeline or personal pipeline that you have. Um, you get getting constant feedback of the state of your code with respect to the entire pipeline of tests. So anyway, uh, so the first step of this idea would be to continuously run your changes uh, in a personal pipeline represented here by the blue workspace pipeline. So when the pipeline is green, uh, or so it's basically constantly, you know, bringing in your changes and running through the entire pipeline and letting you know this, you know, the state of the pipeline, whether you're green or not. When the pipeline is green, those, those changes are migrated to the extreme integration pipeline as potential candidates for merging to trunk, uh, which will become more apparent here on the next slides uh, why we're doing that. Um, so now you've got automatic testing of your changes, you know, in, in your pipeline as opposed to, you know, in a rep for your workspace. The next step is to have the extreme integration pipeline also automatically merge changes from trunk. So this way you can see what the state of your code is, not just in relation to your workspace, but what the state of your code is in relation to the trunk and all the other code that other people have uh, checked in. So if your code is in conflict with changes to trunk, you might, your personal workspace might be green as uh, the pipeline goes, but it's conflicting with something in trunk and you can now be immediately notified that when that extreme integration pipeline fails. So you can choose to continue working with your changes in your personal pipeline, but now you know that potentially uh, the work you're doing is going to have, you know, uh, you know, there's some conflict with what's happening in trunk, you're potentially, you know, gonna have more and more merge problems or the code you're building on, you're maybe building it on, you know, some different concept than, you know, what someone else has, you know, changed into trunk. Eventually you're gonna wanna integrate that change from trunk, you know, into your personal workspace and get it back to, uh, you know, to where, what you're working on is, is um, not in conflict with, with what's happening in trunk. So you resolve the problem, you know, integrate to your uh, personal workspace, uh, resolve the problems, and then you know, your changes uh, uh, get automatically uh, integrated back into the extreme integration uh, pipeline. And now that you know that your changes work with the trunk changes, you can uh, you know, choose to merge your changes to trunk. And then, so one final thing I'll throw out is that if you, if you want to have really extreme integration, you could have the extreme integration pipeline auto merger changes to trunk any time it turns green. So basically, as long as any change you have made locally passes all testing in the pipeline with the, with the latest changes from trunk, it automatically becomes a release candidate. So almost like um, instead of just like auto testing, it's like you're automatically you know, working live on the, uh, on the system. Uh, almost like you're making changes to the live system in production, but with the confidence of an entire pipeline of testing you know, having been performed and backing up that your change and, you know, your code is in a state that's ready uh, to go to production. Obviously, you'll want to have make sure that you have a really good system of testing and monitoring to try something like that. Um, so that's uh, pretty much all I have for today. I uh, shortened it maybe a little too much for the presentation because I usually have a longer thing where I go into even crazier things, but uh, that's probably <laughs> enough, uh, enough for uh, today. Uh, I'll go ahead and thank the sponsors for making this event possible today, and uh, especially thank CloudBees for allowing me to come speak and, um, and share my insanity. Thank you, everyone. Okay.